Good morning and welcome to the uh, budget committee for February 3rd. Uh, this is the Halifax Regional Council. We have two dates scheduled for this meeting. This meeting is going to start now and we'll take a recess and continue on Friday morning at 10 a.m. Um, so I'd like to uh, call this meeting to order uh, and I'd like to run through the list of all of the councillors in order just to do an audio and video check. Uh, so let's start with uh, District 1 and Councillor Deagle Gammon, please. Good morning, Mr. Chair, and hello everyone from uh, District 1, Waverly, Fall River, Muscadaba Valley, and all of the communities in between. Good morning, and thank you. Uh, District 2, Councillor Hensby. Good morning all, and it's very pleasant to see the Nova Scotia power outage did not have one reference of anybody out of power on the whole eastern shore as of this morning. We had some some uh, some outages during the storm, but uh, they quickly got repaired, and thank you, Nova Scotia power. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Councillor Kent, District 3. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Happy to be here from District 3. Just want to note that my background screen is coming to you from beautiful Baker Drive in Russell Lake West. Encourage you all to come and visit sometime and take advantage of what we have to offer here in our district on the other side. Wonderful, thank you very much. Uh, district 4, Councillor Purdy. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Uh, happy to be here from District 4, Cool Harbor, Westfall, Lake Lagoon, and Sherry. Super, thank you. Uh, district 5, Councillor Austin. Uh, here and ready to go, Mr. Chair. Good stuff. Thank you very much. Uh, District 6, Councillor Mancini. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Tony. Um, uh, District 7, Councillor Mason. Uh, here, ready to participate in our uh, fun budgeting process, uh, calling in from Halifax Peninsula South Downtown. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Smith, are you with us yet? Okay, we are still waiting on Councillor Smith. Uh, Councillor Cleary, District 9. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, coming in live from Halifax, West Armdale. Uh, you can see Holly go lightly uh, behind me watching over our meeting. Uh, that's the mural on the old Oxford Theatre, now the Oxford Tap Room on Quintool Road. Excellent. Gotta love tap rooms. We're going to have one here in Sackville. Um, District 10, Councillor Morris. Good morning, Mr. Chair and colleagues. Delighted to be joining you from Clayton Park District 10 this morning. Thank you. And District 11, Councillor Cuddle. Good morning from Purcell's Cove, Spryfield, Sambro Loop, Prospect Road. Nice to see you all. Nice to see you too. Thank you very much. Uh, District 12, Councillor Stoddard. Good morning, Mr. Chair and fellow colleagues coming to you from Timberley, Lakeside, Beachville, and Clayton Park West, and celebrating uh, the African Heritage Month with my Jamaican Heritage flag in the back. Good morning there to you go. all. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. And District 13, Councillor Lovelace. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Good morning, colleagues. Coming to you live from Hammonds Plain, St. Margaret's Bay. Wonderful. Good morning. Uh, District 14, Councillor Blackburn. Hello, good morning everybody from District 14 where we are celebrating today because uh, the uh, Lewis Lake area in Upper Sackville was just named yesterday a protected space by the province. So we are uh, we are celebrating the environment here in District 14 today. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, District 16, Deputy Mayor Oset. Good morning from Balmy Bedford Wentworth today. Nice mild day and uh, looking forward to working with all of you. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, and Mr. Mayor from City Hall. Good morning, um, Chair. Nice to see everybody this morning from uh, City Hall where the Pan-African flag flies uh, proudly in uh, Grand Parade, which we raised on Monday morning in honor of African Nova Scotia Heritage Month. Good stuff. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Smith, are you uh, with us? OK, we are still working on uh, reaching out to Councillor Smith. I apologize for the delay in getting started this morning. Uh, we were having some uh, technical issues with that. Um, so the meeting has been called to order. The next item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes of January 12th and 13th, 2021. Can I have a motion to approve the minutes, please? 
Motion to approve. I'll second that. Uh, I think that was Councillor. I can't remember. I didn't recognize the voice. I'm sorry. Who's who moved it? Oh, Councilor I think Councillor. Yeah, Councillor Stoddard just beat me. Okay, <laughs> Councillor Stoddard to move it, and who seconded it, please? I seconded it. Councillor Cuddle, Cuddle, thank you very much. Okay, any errors or omissions? Okay, all in favor of the minutes of January 12th and 13th, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Wonderful, thank you very much. Uh, call for declaration of conflicts of interest. Super, thank you. Uh, the next item is public participation. And as a reminder to those watching, uh, in order to have signed up as a speaker, uh, the deadline was 4.30 on the business day prior to this hearing. Uh, we have one speaker signed up for today's meeting. And so the registered speaker today is Florence Pine. And I'm going to hand it over to the clerk. Good morning. Florence, please make sure that your webcast or TV broadcast is muted and that you're listening using your phone. Press star six on your phone and you'll hear an announcement that you're no longer muted. That you may then begin speaking. You have up to five minutes to speak. Once you have finished your comments and answering any questions of clarification, please hang up your phone and you may watch the rest of the meeting using your webcast. Back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, Florence, are you with us? Good morning, Mr. Chair, Mr. Mayor and Councillors. Good morning. Um, I am addressing the recommended increase in property tax for homeowners and businesses in, in the HRM. I, like am, like most seniors, on a fixed income. Our income is going to be in our income tax is going to increase this year due to CERB, power rates, water rates, any utility and insurances have or could alre have already or could increase. The NFURB is useless. All the utilities have to do is make a request and for the most of the time it's granted. The increases are handed out <clears throat> as an allowance to a spoiled child. What does this have to do with the increased property and business tax? If the, <clears throat> if the increase to the property tax and business tax goes through, it will contribute to the destruction of <clears throat> what is left of our economy. Property taxes go up, my disposable income goes down. Businesses have had a difficult time this past year at, with, due to COVID-19. Some are barely keeping afloat and some have already closed their doors permanently. When a business tax is increased, the business cannot afford to absorb this tax. It is passed on to the consumer. Therefore, the consumer is dinged twice. By doing this, the consumer, yes, I do, <clears throat> sorry, pardon me. I do like to go out and eat once in a while, but if these increases keep going, my dining out experiences are going to consist of hot dogs in my backyard. I know it's very brief um, little speech, but that is what I have to say. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate the uh, the brevity and the and the concern that you're showing especially. Uh, thank you for stepping forward. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Council. Do we have any questions of clarification from the speaker? Okay, thank you very much, Florence. I Again, I do appreciate that. We uh, enjoy and appreciate uh, hearing from the members of public about uh, any of the concerns and we will take those into consideration. Um, our next item on the agenda is the uh, budget from the Chief Administrative Office. Uh, to start, could I have someone put the motion on the floor, please? And that I believe we have a presentation from the CAO. I could put the motion on the floor, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Chief Administration Administrative Office. Motion that the Budget Committee direct the Chief Administrative Officer to incorporate the Chief Administrative Office Business Unit proposed 
2021-2022 budget and business plan as set out and discussed in the January 25th, 2020 staff report and supporting presentation by staff in the draft 2021-22 operating budget. I so move. Thank you, Councillor Stoddard. Do we have a seconder for that? Seconded by Lisa. Thank you, Councillor Blackburn. Uh, please proceed. Well, good morning, Mr. Chair. Good morning, good morning, Mr. Mayor, members of the Committee of the Whole on Budget, CFO Jim Fraser, uh, Caroline Blair Smith, Executive Director of Human Resources, John Trays, Municipal Solicitor and Executive Director of Legal and Legislative, Evangeline Coleman Saad, who is the Auditor General, and colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Happy to be here this morning, and it's certainly a privilege and a pleasure for me to recommend the CAO Business Unit budget to you today. With me are Sally Christie, Senior Advisor to the CAO, Kim Carver, Executive Coordinator to the CAO, Paul Johnson, Managing Director of Government Relations and External Affairs, Tracy Jones Grant, Managing Director, Office of Diversity and Inclusion in the African Nova Scotian Affairs Integration Office, Melody Campbell, Manager of the Council Support Office, and Lisa Martin, our financial analyst with finance asset management and ICT. Mr. Chair, I'm very thankful for the great work they all do and with their respective teams and to assist CEO deliver on regional council's priorities. So slide one speaks to our mission and our business unit mission is to create a great place to live, work and play by becoming the best managed municipality in Canada. Slide two, please. CAO Business Unit includes the CAO's office, the Councillor Support Office, the Mayor's office, and his and in support staff, Government Relations and External Affairs, that includes the Public Safety Advisor to the CAO, Social Policy and Planning, Economic Development and Regulatory Modernization, and the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, African Nova Scotian Affairs Integration Office. Slide three, please. So this slide speaks to what we do as a business unit, Mr. Chair. CEO Administrative Office provides corporate-wide leadership, strategic direction, and gu operational guidance to all business units. The Office of Diversity and Inclusion, African Nova Scotian Affairs Integration Office, is focused on building an inclusive organizational culture that values and reflects the diverse community that we serve. Our Government Relations and External Affairs Office uh, supports regional council priorities through the provision of strategic advice to the corporation on a range of, of initiatives. This includes intergovernmental relations, economic development, public safety, social policy, regulatory modernization, and, and relationships with the business improvement districts and the Halifax Partnership. Of course, the Office of the Mayor, staff there, coordinate constituent relations, communications, and administrative support to the Mayor. And our Councillor Support Office coordinates constituent relations, communications, and administrative support for members of Council. Slide four, please. So what does the CAO do? Well, now I'm often asked that question. So, you know, the CAO provides executive leadership to the HRM organization. It's responsible for the fiscal stewardship in relation to our people and our financial and physical assets. For example, it's my responsibility to prepare the annual budget for regional council's consideration and to operate the various programs of the municipality in an effective and efficient manner. The CAO also promotes a positive corporate culture, provides leadership for strategic initiatives and major projects, ensures engagement with stakeholders and communities, and manages issues. In collaboration with the mayor, councillors, the CAO staff team, and arm's length partners like Halifax Water, Discover Halifax, Events East, Halifax Port Authority, universities and colleges, and the Halifax Stan, uh, Stanfield International Airport, and the Halifax Partnership. Slide five, please. This slide speaks to uh, our, our employee count. So this shows the, what the 2021 approved budget uh, had in terms of staff count and what the plan changes are going forward. So in 2021-22, we had 34.3 FTEs. Uh, plan change is 14 for a total of 48.3. And that includes full-time and part-time and permanent positions. And it's calculated and the calculated value is based on the normal working hours of each, each position. The full-time change actually includes eight positions transferred from other business units. So seven positions that were private uh, 
previously associated with HR and diversity and inclusion and CO. So HR uh, prior to this budget uh, included both human resources and the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, African Nova Scotian Affairs Integration Office. So those positions, we, we changed the structure of the organization to bring diversity and inclusion and ANSTEO over to the CAO's office. So that's what you see there. And one is from the corporate and customer services, which is really our the transfer of one position from corporate and customer services, uh, regulatory modernization, modernization position, or what we commonly refer to as a red tape reduction uh, office. Uh, and there's one, one person associated with that. So those eight positions uh, are transferred in for this particular budget as a reflection of the change in the organizational structure. So slide six, please. To speak to the uh, five new permanent positions and the one new temporary position, and I'll, I just want to make sure that people understand that these positions are, are actually included in the in the budget target number. So every business unit was given a budget target. These positions are actually included in my budget target and they're not, not considered an over. Uh, of course, council can, can decide otherwise, but that's how we approach this particular these particular positions. Uh, the permanent positions are a program coordinator with the Public Safety Office and a, a new advisor in diversity and inclusion in relation to accessibility services, social policy specialist under government relations and external affairs, a regulatory modernization analyst with, with government relations and external affairs, and a council communication specialist under, with the council or support office. The temporary seasonal position is an advisor within diversity and inclusion ANZIO under the uh, related to gender services and it's, and it's on a term until December 21st. Of course, there's a, there's a number of other net adjustments here in here, including a 0.6 position transferred over from HR, diversity, inclusion, ANZIO included in the mix. So as I mentioned earlier, all the staffing adjustments are within the budget target assigned to our business unit and not considered over budget items. I will now provide you with more detail on those positions and why we feel they are needed. So first up is the uh, communication specialist with the, with the corporate uh, council support office, sorry. So that position would coordinate and manage processes related to the council wide efforts, such as newsletters, reports, ads, public service announcements, web management and council briefs while ensuring communication strategies and activities support the vision and corporate direction of the Halifax Regional Municipality. So this is not about political messaging, this is to support councillors with um, with providing information support so that they can effectively communicate with constituents on things that HRN is doing. The position would be responsible for the delivery of confidential executive services to counselors and staff, detailed research and analysis, networking with internal and external stakeholders, report preparation, strategic writing, and exceptional, and have, and they would also need uh, obviously exceptional verbal communication skills. Further, that incumbent would provide strategic communication recommendations and marketing and communication services to the councillors and the councillors support staff regarding corporate projects and priorities. Uh, the diversity advisor, that position began as an intern from our Bridging the Gap program, a very successful program as you will, many of you will be well aware. And many times we bring, we bring people in, in through the Bridging the Gap program and they, they, we then progress them into term positions and, and many a times into permanent uh, work with HRM. So it's a great way to bring people in the organization. So that that position began as an intern, then progressed to a term position to work specifically with planning and development, to work in the African Nova Scotian and diverse communities. And that term, uh, that term position expires on March 31st, 2021. However, recognizing the significant impact on our work, that position has been moved into the permanent position in our wage model. And the responsibilities of that position include community engagement regarding projects like St. Pat's, Coma, and Beachville, and working with the planning and working with planning and development under Kelly Denty's leadership to develop community engagement guidelines. We're working with diverse communities and further anti-black racism work. The program coordinator under the UN Women's Safe Cities and Safe Public Spaces for Women and Girls program, which is a, which is a, an initiative. We are delivering under Government Relations and External Affairs Public Safety Office under uh, Amy Siciliano's leadership. This position will coordinate the implementation of gender-based violence program, which is a key component of HRM's public safety strategy. 
You'll recall in August of 2019, Regional Council approved HRM's participation in the UN Women Safe Cities and Safe Public Spaces for Women and Girls program, which includes a commitment to adequately resource its implementation for which this position is required. And the responsibility of that position would include a scoping study addressing gender-based violence in public spaces, which is underway, which will form the basis of a set of recommendations for which the program coordinator will lead implementation and evaluation. Without a coordinator responsible for that program, the impact of this program on HRM's ability to improve the safety of women and girls will be weak, given the existing responsibilities of the public safety advisor. We also assume program operations by engaging on the development of recommended actions to respond to the safety of women and girls, develop an implementation plan and evaluation tools to monitor progress and seek resources and partnerships to ensure outcomes are in fact attainable. They would lead, this person would lead the Women's Safety Assessment Tool, a key component of the UN Women Program that has already seen significant uptake from residents and community stakeholders. In relation to social policy coordination under government relations and external affairs, homelessness is a growing issue in HRM and the onset of the global pandemic has increased the number of residents unable to secure adequate housing or shelter. And as you all know, we're dealing with that on a daily basis. Through approval of the social policy, Halifax Regional Council directed staff to prioritize the issue of housing and homelessness, but the municipality does not have coordinated resources or structures in place that are fully uh, focused solely on homelessness. We need somebody, Mr. Shared, who gets up in the morning and focuses on that issue at the operational level. Responsibilities include developing, homeless, uh, developing a homelessness plan to focus on a coordinated effort, coordinate HRM's response to homelessness as a core duty, and we'll work with partners to facilitate and service coordination, service coordination, sorry, and systems level planning, and while also working to address and advance HRM's actions and prior, priorities related to homelessness. Finally, the uh, regulatory modernization analyst under government relations and external affairs, regulatory modernization, led by Holly Richardson. Holly's doing a great job for us, but uh, frankly, she's a one person show and um, we need to have additional resources in order to be more to deliver that program in a more uh, wholesome way and, uh, and to enhance our partnership with the province of Nova Scotia. That has been in existence now since 2018. We've been partnering with the province to reduce red tape for business and, re and reform regular right and reform regulation in priority areas through the joint project for regulatory modernization. Chaired by uh, currently chaired by Jordy Morgan. And HRM's role in the regulatory modernization initiative has been coordinated by one staff position, which is Holly, while the province has several resources dedicated to its role in this project. So the project has received some support from the Regime the Gap intern position, which ended effective December 2020. So we need a permanent resource there to continue the good work, and uh, that position would provide corporate-wide technical support to the delivery of HRM's regulatory modernization program by reducing regulatory red tape and improving the quality of, reg of regulation to deliver municipal policy. Further, they would provide technical expertise and develop business solutions to modernize regulation in priority areas through regulatory impact assessment tools, interdepartmental collaboration, and capacity building, stakeholder engagement, customer service development, and regulatory modernization performance measurement. This work is essential to the municipality delivering on its commitments to the next phase of the joint project. And I must say that the joint project has been quite successful, and I appreciate the work and the collaboration with Freddie Crooks over uh, to the province uh, and his team, and uh, certainly uh, appreciate the opportunity to work together on this very important initiative, cut red tape for businesses. Slide seven, please. Now I'm going to speak to the business unit budget itself. So the CEO business unit budget is proposed to increase by 14.7% over the June recast budget and 11.7% over the March budget. At a high level, the proposed increase is due to restating some expenses from the March budget due to COVID, about 50% of those expenses cut, adding five new positions in the priori priority areas of public safety, social policy, diversity, inclusion, ANCO, and communication support for council, as I just mentioned. Money for the African Nova Scotian Road to Prosperity Economic Action Plan, usual wage increases, Moving our red tape reduction unit known as regulatory modernization from corporate and customer services to the CEO business unit. Monies for the public safety strategy and police policing services reviews and additional costs 
associated with our UN Women's Safe City program and costs associated with coordinating our social policy work focused on homelessness issues. <clears throat> so you'll see that in the chart, the summary, the March and June budget amounts are restated to include diversity, inclusion, and zeal from human resources. So I'm going to give you a little overview of the operating budget and um, more detail, of course, will be provided in the next few slides. So in the proposed budget, compensation and benefits have increased by about $1.08 million. We have added five new positions and we've had some positions added from other business units that were not part, were not part of the restated numbers, including and including the vacancy management reduction costs and other annual increases. Our external services increased by 85,000. Public, the public uh, safety and policing review strategy refresh is 100,000 and we, we offset that by about 15,000 through other adjustments in the budget so the net increase is 85,000. Other than that, of course, the public safety strategy needs to be refreshed uh, this time and of course, council has directed me to engage in a public in a policing review, policing services review, so there's some costs associated with some external resources in that respect. Other goods and services increased by $111,000, and we added back approximately 50% after the COVID cuts. We added back some conferences, uh, out-of-town travel, local travel, community events, and miscellaneous adjustments, all adding up to about $111,000. Other fiscal uh, increased by $336,000. In, in that number is $175,000 for the African Nova Scotian Economic Action Plan. The council has approved 60,000 for the economic development strategy uh, through the Halifax partnership, a 2% increase in the Halifax partnership services agreement of 38,000 and a $50,000 uh, adjustment related to an error during the COVID cuts last year. An error in the, in the, um, in the final numbers that were, were put together uh, as a final budget. Um, in terms of the uh, slide eight, the CAO office, uh, just a few changes there I'd like to highlight. Compensation adjustments amount to $47,000. We remove vacancy management, which will cost us $53,100. We don't expect any vacancies this year. Uh, COVID add backs add up to about $42,600. Uh, the council support office, there's a change in budget of about $307,000. Uh, the compensation, ad compensation adjustments, including staff and counselors within the uh, counselor support office, uh, about $104,500. The new new communications specialist adds up to $75,300. Remove vacancy management. Again, no vacancy management anticipated, $26,900. Increased printing costs for newsletters, uh, $24,000. And we added some of the things cut from the March to the uh, June budget, COVID budget of $76,300. Under DNI, Diversity and Inclusion, African Nova Scotia Affairs Integration Office, the change in budget is $529,400. Compensation adjustments amount to $34,500. Removal of the vacancy management, again, no vacancies anticipated, $11,800. New permanent position, and the Advisor of Diversity and Inclusion, African Nova Scotia Affairs Integration Office, $86,200, and Tracy will speak to that more detail in a minute. Um, new term position under the uh, advisor, uh, as an advisor in the Diversity and Inclusion ANZIO office, 91,300, that was an overstaff from HR. And during the COVID cuts, um, 79,500 and 50,000, as mentioned earlier, were removed in error, and that amounts to, that amounts to um, $129,000. <clears throat> Just give me one second here. I'm going to go back to another point. Here we go. And of course, the uh, the African Nova Scotia Economic Action Plan was 175,000. So under GRIA, uh, we had compensation adjustments adding up to 42.5, removal of vacancy management at 39.3. There's a, the social policy coordinator focused on homelessness would be 94. All in, it would be 94.4. The regulatory modernization analyst at 76.6. New position program coordinator for the UN Women's Safe City program at 88.8. The um, 
the regulatory modernization system moved over from corporate and customer services was 114.6. And uh, we removed prior one time adjustments for public safety grant from the Department of Justice at 69.9. And the public safety police unit review at 100,000. And of course, the Halifax Partnership, the grant at 2%, which is 37.6. And the economic development strategy at 135 minus the 75,000 economic recovery, which nets out to 60. And the Department of Justice grant uh, with public safety minus that 69 minus the 31.5, which equals 37.5 required for 21.22, and the rest will be requested in 22.23. COVID delayed that obviously, and uh, so we're looking at it spreading it over two years. And we had a under GRIA, we had a couple of uh, add backs on the from the COVID budget at 22.3. In the mayor's office, we had co normal compensation adjustments there, uh, adding up to $23,000. We removed vacancy management of $6,400. Again, no anticipated vacancies there. And COVID addbacks amount to $17,800. Slide nine, please. So when you look at uh, slide nine, the one, there's 1 million, there's new positions and salary adjustments of 1,076,800. That really is, is related to about 250,000 worth of compensation adjustments, vacancy management is about 130. 7.5 new positions at 421.3 and there were some errors uh, and corrections uh, in the in the in the accounting department of $265,600. Uh, we removed the one-time adjustment for public safety grant from Department of Justice as I mentioned earlier and that was simply due to the program getting started later than anticipated and uh, the portion of a grant received in 2019-20 was carried forward to use in 2021. Halifax Partnership Economic Development Strategy. Again, we removed the economic recovery plan of 75,000, but added in the economic development strategy at 135 for a net of one uh, of uh, sixty thousand dollars. Miscellaneous adjustment. Again, I spoke to the Department of Justice grant, um, the budget error in DNI, the reserve transfer should have been removed during the corporate adjustments from the county perspective last year, 50,000. Um, and um, I'd like to go to slide 10, please. At which time I will now turn the presentation over to Paul Johnson, our Managing Director of Government Relations and External Affairs. Mr. Johnson. I think I'm all geared up. <clears throat> so thank you, Jacques, uh, for that introduction and, and good morning to everybody. Uh, so as Jacques mentioned, I'm Paul Johnston, the Managing Director of Government Relations and External Affairs. Uh, so I'll be running through the GRIA. <laughs> I have to apologize in advance. Uh, I force of habit, I may refer to Government Relations and ex External Affairs by the acronym GRIA. I'll try, try to remember not to do that. Um, so I'll be running through our deliverables in three of the Council priority areas, uh, specifically those that Jacques spoke to for which we hope to uh, dedicate additional resources to in 2021-22. Uh, uh, so next slide, please. So first, under prosperous economy, uh, economic growth, um, we'll work with the Halifax Partnership this year to develop the 2022-2027 economic strategy. Uh, so this work was supposed to commence uh, in this current fiscal as the existing strategy had a time frame of 2016 to 2021. But like, uh, like many other things in our lives, COVID changed those plans. Uh, so as with the existing strategy, deliverables and other responsibilities will be outlined in a revised service agreement with the Halifax Partnership, and that'll be brought back to Council for approval uh, along with the framework of the new strategy uh, sometime in the coming months. Uh, so as a first step, the Halifax Partnership is working on a proposed approach to development of the strategy, which they hope to bring forward to the Community Planning and Economic Development Standing Committee for endorsement uh, either later this month or sometime in March. So you'll get more, more detail on that uh, very soon. And as Jacques mentioned as well, in conjunction with development of the revised strategy, we'll continue to work with the Halifax Partnership in the coming year to implement the COVID-19 Economic Response and Recovery Plan to help the economy and community weather the healthcare crisis, prepare to restart when conditions allow and get back to the municipality's previous long-term growth trends. Uh, so the next update on progress with the recovery plan is also expected to be provided to the Community Planning and Economic Development Standing Committee, uh, hopefully sometime in March. 
Uh, so next under the prosperous economy priority is the regulatory modernization project. Uh, as Jacques alluded to in his, his remarks opening the session, uh, Council adopted a Charter of Governing Principles for Regulation Administrative Order in 2018. Uh, and this helps guide how new regulation or changes to existing regulation are considered. This administrative order emphasizes using the lightest regulatory touch where possible or non-regulatory action with an overall goal to improve our regulatory environment by reducing red tape and improving regulation as a policy tool. So the first three years of the regulatory modernization project has uh, focused on developing regulatory impact assessment tools and making small but tangible regulatory changes like removing steps to reduce the time it takes to process a permit or a license, updating bylaw regulation and improving customer service to support businesses with their compliance obligations. So in 2021-22, uh, the Reg Mod project will be fo focusing on implementing phase three of the joint project for regulatory modernization in conjunction with the province. Uh, so as Jacques mentioned, we have a very, very good working relationship with the province uh, in terms of the joint project aspect of this. Uh, and we'll be looking to reduce red tape in areas of joint interests, such as new regulation under the Traffic Safety Act and regulatory improvements to help businesses who have been impacted by the pandemic. Uh, secondly, we'll be implementing internal priorities, including regulatory impact and business impact assessment tools, uh, an engagement strategy, related actions under the COVID-19 economic recovery plan, which I mentioned earlier, and regulatory reform training aligned with policy development best practice. Uh, and finally, we uh, and this is the uh, majority of the work of the, uh, the new position that uh, that Jacques had mentioned, um, working on a performance measurement framework for the regulatory modernization project, which will help us to develop baseline data to monitor regulatory, regulatory change progress, uh, data collection, analysis, and reporting of red tape reduction and regulatory change results, and establishing service improvement targets and identifying regulatory areas for continuous improvement. Uh, and I should note before I move on that Holly Richardson, who, uh, as Jock mentioned, has been doing a fantastic job as the lead on regulatory modernization, is actually here with us today if you have uh, any questions in this area. Uh, so moving on to the priority area of inclusive communities, uh, we will continue to coordinate the implementation of HRM's social policy with an emphasis on its three focus areas, food security, connected communities, and housing and homelessness. So as Council directed when the social policy was approved in May of 2020, we've established a social policy team comprised of staff from throughout the organization. And much of the team's work to date is focused on responses to the COVID crisis, but we have recently begun developing more specific actions uh, for the coming years and setting some, uh, some priority areas. So as the CAO mentioned, one area we want to bring and need to bring more focus to in 2021-22 through the social policy work is in the area of homelessness. Um, we'll do this by exploring ways to better coordinate and resource the municipality's role in preventing and responding to this issue, which will include assigning a position exclusively to this area, as Jacques mentioned, and developing a municipal action plan. As we don't have specific expertise or dedicated resources in this, this area at the current time. Uh, to start work on this initiative, we've begun looking at similar plans and actions in other jurisdictions, and we'll build on that work to, uh, to come forward with a, an HRN specific plan. Uh, also in relation to homelessness, we'll be bringing a report to Council very soon, again hopefully in the next month, regarding ongoing support for our Street Outreach Navigator program that we currently fund in partnership with four of our business improvement districts. Uh, so in the area of safe communities, um, Jacques, uh, Jacques referenced the public safety strategy uh, in his remarks, which is a roadmap for making evidence-based upstream investments in community safety and well-being, uh, with the overall goal to reduce crime, criminalization, and victimization, and the impacts on individuals, families, and our communities. So since its implementation in 2018, we have increased our understanding that responsibility for public safety reaches across the municipality, far beyond just the traditional realm of policing. So we've advanced a more collaborative approach and increased resources 
and support to communities disproportionately impacted by crime and victimization. Uh, the 2020 annual report on the strategy will be presented to Council at the end of this fiscal year, and 2021-22 will see us embark on the initial work required to develop a new revised public safety strategy. Uh, so secondly in this area, uh, in late 2019, Halifax joined a growing number of cities worldwide working to address sexual violence and harassment in public spaces by joining the UN Women's Safe Cities and Safe Public Spaces for Women and Girls program. This year we'll build on the success of the first year by finalizing a scoping study and using it to develop a set of recommendations and commence implementation planning. In addition, we'll continue to build capacity and awareness of the Women's Safety Assessment Tool, a planning tool that bases metrics of safety on women's experiences in public safeties. Uh, and in terms of the Public Safety Office, uh, aside from these two strategic initiatives, the coming year will also see us continue to advance a prototype for an index of community safety and well-being, convene key stakeholders to identify and seek resources to fund the development of a municipal substance use strategy as directed by Council, and continue to strengthen the capacity of existing community mobilization teams with training, knowledge exchanges, as well as crisis prevention, preparation and response. Uh, we also have a goal to increase the number of community mobilization teams to four. And thankfully, Amy Siciliano, who is our public safety advisor, uh, is also here today to take any questions you may have in this area. Uh, so that is it for my slide. Now I believe I'm turning it over to my brilliant colleague, Tracy Jones Grant. Thank Chair, you, before, Paul. Mr. Chair, before, I, before Amy uh, gets underway, I just wanted to uh, uh, highlight one of my one of my uh, one of my neglectful um, activities here, which was to, I failed to acknowledge this morning the presence on the on the call of Sean McKinley. So Sean McKinley is the mayor's chief of staff. So Sean Sean, of course, works with many of you and with, supports the mayor and his work. And of course, we have a great working relationship between myself and Sean and our respective offices. So I just wanted to acknowledge that Sean McKinley is here and prepared to answer any questions related to the mayor's uh, budget as well. So Tracy, over to you. Thank you. Good morning. Um, it is my pleasure to speak to you about the Office of Di Diversity and Inclusion, African Nova Scotian Affairs. Next slide, please. So um, looking at our council priorities under communities and inclusive communities, um, we will continue in the upcoming year our work with respect to the task force on the commemoration of Edward Cornwallis and the recognition and commemoration of Indigenous history. Uh, our work will also continue around an immigration strategy. The municipality some years back had an immigration strategy it is time for a refresh. Uh, we've done some consultations in community previous to, to COVID, um, and we're still doing some work um, virtually with the community, and we'll be developing a updated and renewed strategy. Uh, with the province's focus on uh, accessibility, we are in the final phases of completing the, ex the corporate accessibility strategy that we will bring to Council for your review and approval. And this will help us al align with the work that is happening at the provincial level and continue to help us build an accessible and inclusive municipality. Um, another key uh, initiative that um, Council has also had its eye on and has um, approved is our work towards addressing anti-Black racism. Um, we are in the process of developing a corporate-wide anti-Black racism strategy that will help guide us as we address the issues and concerns related to anti-Black racism in our municipality. Through our work with the Halifax Partnership and under the area of economic, prosperous economic economy and economic growth, we continue our work with the African Nova Scotia Road to Economic Prosperity Action Plan, which was recently launched um, to a very successful launch and will help us to address and improve um, the economic prosperity of persons of African descent in our municipality. Next slide, please. 
Diversity and inclusion is a significant priority, is the focus of our work, is around which our team is built. Uh, Jacques did speak to uh, the additional um, diversity and inclusion um, uh, employee, uh, a position that we had that started as an intern that is embedded in our planning and development division um, that will now become a permanent part of African of um, diversity and inclusion office African Nova Scotian Affairs. This is very important and very significant for us to be able to continue our work with respect to some significant projects that the municipality is working on, including how we work on the Cogswell development, um, the St. Pat's uh, redevelopment, the work that we're doing with ACOMA. A lot of this work involves significant engagement and understanding of how we work with and in the African Nova Scotian community. So this position will continue to help us with that. Through our diversity and inclusion framework, we continue to support the organization um, with addressing issues around diversity and inclusion and with changing how we do our work, working closely with many of the, the business units. Next slide, please. So um, I'm going to talk specifically right now to the uh, anti-Black racism um, project and proposed budget. Um, and this is uh, an option over budget. So um, we have uh, a request for uh, this budget to help support our work with um, the anti-Black racism. Back in July 2021, Council did move a motion to support the Decade for People of African Descent. And part of this is included as part of um, our work with anti-Black racism. We also have made a commitment as a municipality to address anti-Black racism. And I have limited resources currently within my existing staffing and supports in the African Nova Scotian Affairs Integration Office. So I'm gonna do my best to speak to this slide. So what we are talking about is we would need a position to support the strategy and action plan. We would also need uh, monies to support community projects. If we're going to do anti-Black racism, it is not just an internal piece, it's also an external piece. And we, we need to be able to support financially our work as it goes with um, working with external partners. Developing this strategy is not something that we can do alone. So we will need to be look at um, some consulting and support services. Currently, we have initiated some speaking series and awareness campaigns, but we need to really ramp that up. We need to have a dedicated um, awareness campaign and training specifically to addressing anti-Black racism. We had a report from an internal group, an anti-Black racism working group that talked about the need to look at and audit what are we doing as a municipality with respect to anti-Black racism, and that would be a cause. We also heard from that group that um, in the limited budget that the Office of Diversity and Inclusion current the office currently has, there was no dedicated funds to support the work of the African Nova Scotia Affairs Integration Office. And so we've, we're requesting that. Um, in June 2020, Council did uh, approve a, a one-time uh, funding of 300,000 from reserve. So based on that uh, uh, availability of costs, um, and looking at the need to start up our work, in particular uh, funding for the, the position and getting them started, we are looking at an additional cost of $72,500. That's what is needed in this year to help us begin and continue our work with respect to uh, anti-Black racism in the municipality. Thank you. Next slide, please. Jacques, I believe it's over to you. Well, thank you very much, Tracy. Excellent presentation. Thanks for the great work you and your team are doing. Uh, thank you, Paul, for your, your comments and your presentation and adding more detail to uh, for Council's consideration. Uh, just to add to what 
to what uh, or reinforce what Tracy has just mentioned. Uh, you know, I've seen this morning possibly a memo from our CFO Jane Fraser that speaks to the budget process and it speaks to overs and unders. Mm -hmm. So in this budget presentation, we only have one under one over, no unders. We have one over and that over is seventy two thousand five hundred dollars um, that Tracy just spoke to. So we're going to make um, be successful in rolling out our anti black racism efforts, both internally and externally, we would need that additional uh, budget allocation. So the way this works, of course, is that uh, if council, if there is a council that's willing to make a motion to add the seventy two thousand five hundred dollars in in the second in the second and then voted in and it gets that amount of money, it gets put into the what we call the parking lot uh, to the end where at the end of the budget at the end of at the end of the process where all business units have come forward with their applications, all the all the overs and unders are put on the list and council gets to vote on them individually. So should you include make a motion today that would be put on a on an over list and at the end of the process we would then uh, you would then make a final decision on all of the overs at, and unders at one time because it's not fair to council obviously to you know, add things uh, sort of add on and head off way without looking at the bigger picture of the budget and then what the impacts are. So uh, we would certainly, with Tracy, I would certainly highly recommend uh, that we do that in this particular instance uh, because of the importance of, uh, of our program related to anti-black racism. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Um, so for any of the councillors uh, who wish to ask questions uh, about the budget, I would appreciate it if you could uh, enter that into the chat in the um, into Microsoft Teams. At this point, uh, we have four councillors listed and Councillor Blackburn. Mm. Uh, go ahead. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and uh, I, uh, I won't uh, move to uh, put this item in the parking lot. I see that uh, Councillor Mason is uh, gearing up to do that, so I'll uh, I'll let him take the lead on that. But I do have a couple of questions um, about uh, the uh, the staffing with uh, diversity and inclusion. Uh, just looking at the the list of advisors, and I I see that there's um, there's no LGBTQ plus advisor. I thought we had one. Uh, I just remember meeting this fabulous person at, an, at a couple of events and I thought we had an LGBTQ plus advisor. So just wondering if uh, if I'm having a fever dream and I am imagining that that person existed or is this something that is planned for the future? So that's question one. And then with regards to the um, the position that that is being requested, I'm just wondering, is this person uh, uh, once hired, are they going to be working with uh, uh, regional police as well? Is that uh, something that uh, that you see going forward? So those are my my two questions. Thank you. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to Madam Councillor, uh, you did have the pleasure of meeting a wonderful to us LGBTQ advisor. That was a, a fantastic partnership I had with Dave Reedy in Transit. So it was a term position, um, did wonderful, wonderful work for us. It is something that we are looking at down the road, um, recognizing that that is a significant gap in one of our, our areas of service. Um, but no, you you did need a, a wonderful advisor who's started our work on, on 2S LGBTQ um, services and support. So again, I, I thank Dave Rigi in Transit for his support for allowing us to have that person for a position. With the new position, would they work with regional police? Um, I think right now we're, we're going to continue our work with planning uh, because we've got some big major projects that that position is working on currently. And as I work with the chief of police and we identify ways to work together, police, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, we will look at, at how we support police. One thing to let you know, we do have an advisor attached to police. So every business unit one of our advisors works with. So currently our Indigenous advisor is specifically attached to working with police, but draws in the other advisors as, as needed um, related to different issues and things like that. But this, this position won't specifically go over to police at this time. 
Thank All you. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Councillor Kent. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you all for a great presentation. Um, it's encouraging to hear the focuses that we are, are leaning towards. I I do have a question on a couple of things. So just very quickly to you, Tracy, in respect to that, those advisors that are attached to the police, would can we safely say that's also RCMP, not just HRP? Like, how does that work? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to the councillor. So it's actually just to police um, because police is part of our municipal unit. I myself sit on um, the police diversity working group. So that includes RCMP and police. So that's how I connect on the diversity level to that committee. But this person specifically works with our own um, Halifax region. Okay, I, I think um, I, I would like a chance to chat with you perhaps more on that to better understand the, the connectivity there. Um, yeah, this is the RCMP are also municipal policing within our contract that we're, we're in the constructs of what we have. Maybe Jacques could offer something there to help me understand that a little bit. Yeah, over to the CAO. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you to Councillor. The RCMP has its own diversity program and, and resources, um, and uh, you know, because they are they are an acting force, they have their own internal processes and are very much focused on diversity and inclusion uh, and uh, African Nova Scotian affairs as well. In Nova Scotia, they have they have they have resources associated with all that. The extent to which um, the extent to which that could be better coordinated. Uh, Something that we're, we're certainly prepared to look at, but at the moment uh, we we have no um, no operational line of sight on the RCMP and how they manage that that issue. So it, it, it it's because of because of the contrast with the province and the fact that they're autonomous national police force, but they are doing a lot of work in that area. Okay, thank you. I have one more question, Mr. Chair, if I have time. Um, so I, when I look at the presentations that were brought forward today and I'm certainly pleased to hear um, on the focus on public safety. Jacques, you're not going to be surprised that I asked this probably, but I just want to hear some perspectives perhaps from Mr. Johnson around um, where does street safety and uh, speeding and unsafe conditions and because that's crime. I mean speeding is illegal and it's putting communities at risk. There are fatalities that are happening certainly District three, that's the only ones that I can speak to of right now. But it is an area that I want to I want to hear a perspective on. Where does that fit in um, from Mr. Johnson's work uh, from his perspective? Um, I'll ask Paul to speak to that just quickly from my perspective. Uh, um, you know, traffic safety is a responsibility of both the province and, uh, and HRM. And much of that work is carried out through um, transportation, public works, and, and, and traffic safety in that business unit. But uh, uh, on that, I'll pass over to Paul. Yes, thanks for the question. And through the through the chair of the councillor, Jacques took uh, some of the words right out of my mouth. Um, uh, the you know safety in general and, and specifically street and road traffic safety is a, is a cross cutting issue across a lot of our our business units, and I may, um, I may actually, for more context on on our role in public safety, I might put uh, Amy Siciliano on the spot here to uh, provide a few comments on on our role in the public safety strategy and and how that uh, that specific issue might fit in. If uh, you're all right with that, Amy. Sure. <clears throat> sure. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. So there are several actions in our public safety strategy that address um, uh, your concerns. We work with um, Tanya Davis's team on the integrated mobility plan, and that, that I think is the strongest way that we intersect with the public safety strategy and um, uh, and traffic calming and active transportation uh, initiatives. So uh, 
I can give you a concrete example of some of the work that uh, we're doing that also brings in the women's safety assessments to look at um, how we can design active transportation cor corridors more safely for uh, women and girls who may be using them. So we have a project uh, to work with the active transportation initiative in Dartmouth North. It was put on hold with COVID, but it will be coming uh, forward, I believe, this year. Thank you. Uh, That's for now, Mr. Chair. OK, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Mason. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The wording is uh, going to come momentarily into the chat, and I do have a question to help stretch and buy time while we wait for that, which is uh, there was some discussion with councillors about potential changes to the budget in the council support office for the direct mail newsletters that we do that potentially we might reduce that to one or none. And I'm wondering, uh, it's hard to tell at this level of budget uh, uh, whether, you know, what the budget is for that. So I'm wondering if Melody or Jacques could speak to that because there was some concern from those of us that use them as the primary way to reach folks who maybe aren't on, on social media and good for them, let's, let's be honest. So uh, I'm wondering if that is being preserved. So uh, Councillor Mason, this year, it looks like we're gonna be, we've had a substantial increase in the cost of newsletters. Um, they've practically, double for paper and postage. So this year we are at uh, 56 and that will, um, that's the cost that will uh, be for one newsletter this, this year. We'll look uh, when we get an, in hopefully an increase, maybe in the next budget year, we'll go back into two, but this year we are at one. Uh, each newsletter is, is uh, approximately 30. So, so and, uh, thank you. Last year, last year we were able to, um, we were at 32. We had an increase due to two meals, and we were able to adjust the budget to, to, uh, for, uh, to enable every councillor to send a newsletter last year. So um, I'm going to make a motion uh, to add to double that and add that to the parking lot, uh, and then I'll explain why if I have a seconder. I second Seconded. that, Mayor I think that was Councillor Blackburn who seconded it. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Blackburn. So, uh, especially for the new folks, but uh, some of you have heard me say this before, uh, a critical piece of defending the decisions we make that change things that some of the public or a lot of the public don't like is the newsletter if they're done well. And uh, I've been cranking out a newsletter on, like clockwork every six months for eight years. And uh, so when someone says to me, as an example, which does happen, uh, you never talk to me about the center plan and you never ask my opinion, I can point to the newsletter and say, I have emailed, I have mailed your home every six months right to your door about the center plan for the last six years, which is true, I have. So, so I think these are actually mission critical for being able to uh, maintain legitimacy and to uh, reach out to people. I also think that since we have the communications staffer coming in, uh, I would love to see the newsletters change so they have more of a, like there should still be the customized stuff for the district, of course, but there's critical things that could be written by this communications person and communicated as a tool to support the corporate goals of HRM. So I asked your council to support this motion, then I'll come back and make the, the one for the uh, uh, anti-black racism. OK, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Blackburn, for speaking on the newsletter over. Uh, no, I'm I'm good on this. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, do we have any other speakers for the motion that's currently on the floor related to uh, double the current year's budget to 112,000 for the newsletter? Uh, Tim, I wouldn't mind speaking to that for a moment, Chair. Go ahead. Thank you, and I, I will be supporting this because um, I am very concerned, and I've been saying this for years, and Wei has said it quite well as, as well, that uh, we need to communicate more. I, do, I don't know we need to get down too much into the details yet of how we'll use this new person, but I do think that if we're going to bring in a new communications person, and I believe there's a need for that, I do believe we have to give them some money in order to do their jobs. <laughs> Uh, you know, and, and it can't all be electronic. Now, I'm not sure whether that means each councillor does two newsletters. I don't know if that's one that council as a whole does a newsletter and then councillors individually do one once a year. You know, there's all kinds of things to be to be um, 
negotiated or discussed yet, but I, uh, I do think that having this person there without a significant budget or assuming that they would only be doing things electronically would be a bit of a, a unfortunate. But um, anyway, I'll, I'll support this being added and, and probably the next thing as well, but we may have to be very careful as we go further along in this process if we want to keep this uh, increase to 1.9 or less. We're better at adding things than we are taking things out. So, but uh, but for right now, I will support this. If we're going to have this person, we have to be able to use them. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Are there any other speakers in relation to the newsletter? And if Mr. Mr. Chair, I just have a clarification. Absolutely, go ahead. I just want to understand what is the value that we're talking about in this. Just to be clear. Okay. You said, so you said the. Double. 6,000? Okay. Yes, the motion that's in the chat is uh, to double it to $112,000, so that's adding $56,000 to the budget. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, seeing no other speakers, um, I am also going to be supporting this. I have found immense value uh, in sending out two newsletters per year. Um, you can uh, talk about seasonal and more uh, time specific uh, things that are going on in and around all of our different communities. And I, I have seen a lot of benefit to uh, this newsletter. So uh, with that, seeing no further speakers in it, um, I think we would have to go to uh, the clerk to call the roll for the motion. So just want to confirm that that motion that is in the chat is what is what is on the floor. The motion that I see is that the budget committee include $56,000 in additional funding for the costs of for costs for council newsletters in the proposed 2021-22 budget for the chief administrative officer to the parking lot as an over budget option for consideration. That is exactly what I meant to say. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, that, that would be the motion that we are voting on. Okay, we will be starting with District 10 on this uh, roll call. So beginning with District 10, Councillor Morse. Voting in favor of the motion. 11, Councillor Cuddle. Voting in favor. 12, Councillor Stoddard. Voting in favor of the motion. 13, Councillor Lovelace. Voting yes. 14, Councillor Blackburn. Voting yes on the motion. 15, Councilor Russell. In favor? 16, Deputy Mayor Outhit. Yes. District 1, Councilor Dago Gammon. Voting in favor of the motion. 2, Councilor Hensby. Affirmative. 3, Councilor Kent. Voting in favor? 4, Councilor Purdy. Uh, voting in favor? 5, Councilor Austin. In favor? 6, Councilor Mancini. In favor of the motion. Seven, Councillor Mason. For the motion. Eight, Councillor Smith. Four. Nine, Councillor Cleary. Yes. And Mayor Savage. Mayor Savage. I'll support that. And the motion passes. Uh, thank you very much. Councillor Mason, back to you. I'll move that uh, budget committee uh, adds $72,500 in additional request funding to be allocated for the budget parking lot for costs associated with the anti-black racism project for consideration in the budget adjustment list. I so move. Second. Uh, that was Councillor Hensby. Thank you. Uh, are there any further? Okay, Councillor Hensby, do you have anything to add? No, it's a great initiative. Let's move forward. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Othet. Um, thank you, and I will be supporting this, but I just wanted some clarification for staff because we noticed in that presentation that we had a $300,000 one-time uh, reserve used towards this, and I believe that might have been money, part of the money that was going to go on a, a police vehicle. Um, so while I support this, will we not be looking for $372,000 next year, though, or is there a plan to... Uh, mitigate that if you will because it's just I it, it's kind of unusual although I like a setting precedent on this because it may come up later about taking something out of a capital reserve and putting it towards operating um, but uh, it appears that's that's what we're doing here with this 300,000 so I'm just wondering in, uh, from Jacques uh, 
or, or Tracy, doesn't matter, uh, what impact this will have next year. The 72 is, is, is something I'm happy to support. It's a rounding error, but I'm, I'm when it comes up to 400,000 next year, is that is that must my take in uh, is take my take correct? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to Councillor Tracy, can weigh in here as well. Uh, the idea is uh, the 300,000 came out of reserve, so uh, yeah, that's probably the source of uh, source of the funding you know, was associated with uh, capital item, but it was it's actually coming out of operational reserves into into this uh, particular budget, and. Uh, you're absolutely right. Next, right now we have monies uh, in order to do the program. It costs we're expecting it to cost three hundred seventy-two thousand uh, dollars and uh, or three hundred sixty-two thousand dollars. Sorry, and um, you know there's a net of seventy-two thousand five hundred. That money, we fully expect that there will be an equivalent budget having to be added in as an operating line next year mm -hmm. to keep this thing moving. So we are minimizing the impact this year by virtue of the transfer from reserves but uh, on, a, on a go forward basis it would be it would be something we would bake into the budget target and uh, have a have a uh, increase in our actual uh, budget on a permanent basis for this this item the extent of which you know the budget next year and the year after that uh, would be close to this number i don't know but the, at the end of the day we're going we're going to launch this thing and we'll measure and come back to council with with a, a, a budget amount for next year, 22-23. Uh, and uh, we'll know more at that point, but at this point, I think it's safe to assume that you'll be looking at putting this amount of money into the budget on a go forward basis plus inflationary costs going forward. Okay, thank you for the clarification. I'm certainly gonna support this, but I just next year we're gonna to have to be prepared to uh, to decide whether we want to continue this, and I hope we will, but it's it's going to be a, a bigger challenge, that's all. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Thank you, Joe. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Daigle Gammon on the uh, motion f about anti-Black racism. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and actually, uh, Tim was right on my question, which is around sustainability, um, because of the use of the reserve for the one time then I, I'm really concerned about the sustainability of the project. It's listed as a new temporary position, but I was concerned about what temporary meant and if it was going to be a year one, year two, year three, if there is a strategy for how to sustain it. And if ongoing, there might be other partners that could come in around the funding for the position. That's my question or comment, I guess. Thank you. OK, um, Councillor uh, Stoddard. Through you, Mr. Chair, to um, the Diversity and Inclusion Committee. I might have missed it, um, but what does the 85,000 for staff include, please? Is that, that, is that in relation to this motion? Or is that on the main motion? I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. So this motion is for the uh, addition of uh, $75,000. And I'm just wondering if if that question ties to this motion or to the main motion about the CAO's office. I can see how they're related, but I'm just wondering if, if it is specific to this. Um, I would need your advice on that, Mr. Chair. Mr. Mr. Chair, if I may, maybe uh, sure. Tracy could actually uh, address the issue of if you look at the budget, uh, temporary position at around eighty-five thousand dollars, which is which is related to the total expenditure to your point, Mr. Chair, uh, of uh, three hundred sixty-two thousand five hundred. So, I think the councillor is asking what what does that eighty-five thousand represent. So perhaps Tracy could explain that in a bit further detail. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to the councillors. So that eighty-five thousand, if you're looking at it, it's to support the new term position uh, mm -hmm. that will help us do our work with respect to anti-black racism. So that is their salary, their benefits, all of those salary related costs. That's what that 85,000 covers. Um, and then we have looked at what this budget would look like up to 2025. So we have projected uh, what our asks would be in, in future years. 
as we move this forward. Um, but that 85 that you're asking about is specifically salary related costs for the employee to assist us with doing this work. I currently don't have the resources or the capability within the office to focus solely on anti-black racism, um, which is why we've included a position to, to support us. Mr. Chair, if I may, uh, just to support what Basie is saying uh, here, you know, this is a temporary position to get us through uh, to, a, to, an, to a strategy and an action plan. And when we get into the 22-23 budget, you know, it's certainly my intention, I would signal my intention here is to make these that position permanent on a go forward basis. So, you know, this, this initiative, this action plan and strategy, will, the strategy will be adopted by council, hopefully by, you know, first or second quarter of this year, of this fiscal year. And then, um, you know, we will then be in a better position once council decides that what it actually wants to achieve through the strategy, and then we'll be able to resource it appropriately. If you look at the positions within diversity and inclusion historically, we started with one, and uh, I think now we're up to you know, 11 or 12. And sort of how we've done it, we've, you know, we brought in a French advisor and it was on a kind of a contract thing, and we eventually migrated that into a strategy, into a full-time initiative, and things like that. Accessibility advisor would be the same kind of thing. So it's been a progression, and we've added more resources than ANSIO uh, in the same manner. And we've, we've sort of done, so we've sort of established the asset strategy, the action plan, and then resources permanently. So I, I do want to signal the fact that this, you know, I, I don't expect this to be a um, this anti-black anti-black racism strategy to be over in a year, or or or, or uh, can can be resourced to resolve that that societal issue. In a, in a very you know tight timeline this is an ongoing this will be an ongoing effort corporately for the foreseeable future right so, uh, and i think it's important work that we have to resource appropriately so we'll, we'll, we're starting and we'll get a strategy and then we'll we'll have more permanent resources uh, budgeted for in, in subsequent years that's awesome i just wanted to confirm that thank you so much okay thank you very much uh councillor cuddle Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I'm, but, um, I was actually, Kathy uh, just started to um, ask the same question I was going to ask around our external partnerships. And um, Tracy, I heard you talk about those external partnerships, but I'm, I'm just trying to understand how your office interacts with like Halifax partnership with external partners like the BBI, say around the economic um, uh, framework that that we're working on, and you know, again, looking at how we utilize our external partnerships to be more efficient internally, because there's a lot of good people out there. And I, I wonder if you could just speak to a little bit about how you see your office leveraging those external assets through you, Mr. Chair, to the councillor. We work very closely with external partners. Um, I couldn't even probably list the number of external partners that we work with. So specifically related to the African Nova Scotian economic strategy, we are working in partnership with Halifax Partnership to move that forward. And through that partnership that we have with them, there has been the establishment of a community um, group of elders and advisors that will advise the African Nova Scotian Economic Action Strategy. Specifically to anti-Black racism, we can't do this work without working closely with our community partners, whether it's African Nova Scotian Affairs at the province, the Black Business Initiative, Africville, just, just to name a few, even our, our educational resources in the community. So um, we will, we are looking at, there, there's various pieces to the strategy, including the establishment of an African Nova Scotian Advisory Committee to Council. Um, so that will also bring in various partners that will not only advise the work that we're doing operationally around anti-Black racism, but will also provide advice to Council uh, in their work around anti-Black racism. So. Um, through our African Nova Scotian Affairs Integration Office, 
we work extremely closely with our community partners. Um, and we're even right now as part of African Heritage Month, um, all of our programming that we are doing internally, we're working with community partners, bringing in community experts. So that is very important. Um, just with respect to how we budget, uh, there are a variety of grants and opportunities that we do apply for to help us with our work. So as uh, grants become available related to anti-Black racism, for sure we will be applying for those. Uh, some things have come out from the Canadian Race Relations Foundation and others. So we will continue to look for external funds to support the work of the municipality. But the need for the operational stable pieces are very important in order to do the work. Um, I currently run our whole immigration pro um, program through a federal grant. So if that grant stops, how does that impact our work as we continue to work with immigrants in the municipality? So the need for a stable, consistent funding is very important, but we will continue to look to external partners and resources to help us move this work forward. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Tracy. And you know, even like with the immigration, I think about you know ISENS and the work that great work that they're doing there, and and how and how we're tapping into that. Just you know, I, I just looking at kind of the avoidance of duplicating efforts. I guess is is where I'm, what I'm really trying to get at here. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Smith. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, Tracy. Uh, re really quickly on on this, so so I I, I support this and in in and we'll be voting for it. My question again, just to some, get some clarification, because when we did have the discussion around the armored vehicle, we did say that some of that, well, all that money was going to be redirected, um, and for for those who weren't part of that discussion, it was fifty three thousand to the office of diversity and inclusion, twenty-five thousand for special projects, eleven thousand support public safety strategies, uh, and three hundred thousand support any black racism efforts and initiatives. So is is the overs that we're asking for today actually putting that money into the budget that was going to be redirected, or did that already happen at the time when we had the discussion? Because I'm I'm a little unclear on if that money actually went and where this is additional or this is now actually putting it where we say we were going to put it. Yeah, it's Mr. Chair, through you, it's already there and it's a source of funding for the program for this year. So if you, what you see in the chart is, is our list of expenditures adding up to 362.5. The one time funding was, was proven 2021 is 300,000. And uh, of course, there was less amount to be spent about 10,000. Um, that were uh, that were spent in 2021. So the net. What chart? Sorry, which chart? The, the chart on pay on slide uh, slide 12, I think it is. Yeah, slide 12. The options over budget. And where Tracy's presented that. So you see, the 300,000 is coming in as a revenue, right? We're we're showing from the accounting perspective, it's basically a revenue um, that coming in to offset uh, the expenditures of 362.5. So. Yes, the money is there, just that it hasn't been spent yet. And, uh, and now we're lining up. We've lined up, you know, Tracy and her team to come up with a with a budget, and uh, the 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 anti-black racism strategy and action plan will be for you in June. And uh, you know, hopefully by that time we'll have the position filled. Uh, you know, if this budget gets approved by council in early May, this and we'll we'll. we'll we will start the recruitment process obviously in advance, but um, we want to hit the ground running when the strategy is approved. And uh, we also have, as Tracy mentioned, their support for external community projects. Uh, they're at 100,000. We can't do anything to racism. The people alone, we need money for programs and initiatives that will be done in partnership with other organizations and, uh, and, and individual organizations and people. So sort of what we're up to here. Yeah. Okay, uh, great, that, that, that helps. So. Then for the other, actually, you know what? I won't. I won't go there. Would be helpful if we can get as additional information as we, you know, as we get additional information during the budget. That 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 motion that that got the the three hundred thousand dollars and the the fifty three thousand et cetera that was on the armored vehicle. Could we just get a quick memo on 
what efforts that supported, just so we know moving forward, because it's already in the budget and that money's already been spent, well spent quotation. But I think it'd be great just for also the public who were interested in, to know what those efforts were. I think it might be helpful to get that information. Yeah, sure, we can certainly, through you, Mr. Chair, we can certainly provide an update as to where, where, where this is. And Gracie is all, Gracie already has sort of a, when we hire for us to get a memo, because I just asked for the briefing note here not long ago. So all right. <laughs> then we able to do, do is dust it off and get it out to you. So, yeah. As long as it comes through the, but the budget process, I'm happy. At some point. All right, thank you. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Lovelace. Oh. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Tracy. This is this is great to see. Uh, you know, in working with Upper Hammond's Plains for the last couple of years, um, the work that you do is so important um, to building partnership and and also inspiration uh, to the younger community and you know finding ways to access funding. Um, even just to think about bigger uh, projects and knowing the connection between Lucasville and Upper Hammonds Plains and the Community Development Association there. Um, you know, I myself was really surprised to hear that there were seven-ish full-time staff at one time within that Community Development Association. And so thinking about ways that we can um, continue to mentor uh, those young people. And I, I do know, you know, you have training and speaker series, awareness, communication campaign. Certainly that's really essential from a public perspective, but I'm wondering about um, how we go about enhancing um, that uh, sort of core uh, community um, development initiatives that could come directly uh, from the ground from within the community. Um, and so I'm, I'm in support of this, but I'm also, uh, I, I am concerned uh, about the fact that we don't have the sustainability here. Um, you know, we've got 400 years <laughs> of racism to address. We can't do that in, in, in a 12 month period. Uh, so just kind of thinking about you know, as you say, the 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 drying up of federal funding will have a significant impact on how we uh, as a municipality move forward. So, you know, I, I guess, Tracy, what is the plan B um, in in being able to uh, certainly at this point in time, 725, that makes good sense. But uh, I'm just wondering what what's the bigger picture? Uh, what opportunities do we have? Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Twelve million dollar question, right? <laughs> <laughs> Through you, Mr. Chair, to the councillor. First, um, I just want to mention your talk about community development initiatives. So our office worked very closely with um, recreation. Um, recreation has community developers, and we work very closely with them um, on the work that they do in developing community. Um, they're doing great work with back to having strong knowledge, on the ground knowledge of what's happening in communities and their community developers also do a lot of work with community on community needs and issues. So our team does work closely with recreation on that. Plus, um, specifically in looking at uh, Hammonds Plains and Lucasville, our African Nova Scotian Affairs Office is heavily engaged in what's happening in those communities. Also, our new position, our, our person who's embedded in planning is also involved with what's happening in, in that particular area. Um, like, for example, we were very excited to be able to see what happened with the historical fire station there. So our team was, was heavily involved in some of that work. So we continue to work with our internal partners um, to ensure that the voices of, of community are heard and the different voices, whether it's our French community, indigenous community, et cetera. So we do a lot with that. Sustainability. Well, I am really pleased to say I've, I've been with the organization uh, for five going on six years and have been able to champion the growth of the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. So with respect to sustainability, continuing to work with the CAO and our business unit and our executive directors, as we continue to champion diversity and inclusion, we're looking at how this is embedded in the organization, which is leading to sustainability. Specifically around anti-Black racism, we recognize that in one year, we're not going to address it. So we will have to come back with a, a, a budget that is a, a baseline budget that's going to be needed to continue our work around anti-Black racism. 
So when we began the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, we were begging and borrowing from government relations and external affairs that we were a part of when we began. We now have a budget uh, to support our work. And um, as we look forward to our work around anti-Black racism, we will look at what does it take and what finances are needed to sustain and continue that work as, as we go along. As you said, 400 years of history, it's not going to change overnight. So um, we, we are really looking at this in a very holistic manner, including how we engage the African Nova Scotian Economic Action Strategy as part of what we're doing around anti-Black racism. I hope that that helps to answer. Some Wonderful. Thing. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Okay. Thank you. Um, if there are no other speakers for the first time, I'm going to just jump in for a second. Uh, I am absolutely in support of this motion. I have I have no problem with that. I'm curious. Um, uh, Councillor Austin, I, I apologize. I thought you were wanting to speak on the main motion. Uh, why don't you go ahead and then I'll come back after you. You were you're correct. Thank you. <laughs> Main okay. motion. Thank you. Um, so my, my question is actually to the CAO about why this was uh, separated out into an over instead of being included in the uh, regular budget ask. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the question. Uh, <clears throat> so we have a target and we had to meet the target. That's the first part of the answer. The other, the other part of the answer is that I had asked Tracy to take a hard look at the budget uh, for the for this purpose, the anti-black racism strategy, knowing we had 300,000. But uh, you know, I wanted to you know, I wanted to ensure the 300,000, you recall, was strictly related to another expenditure, a capital expenditure that um, so it wasn't basically focused on a plan. So when we looked at the plan, uh, and uh, the actual detail plan, we came up with a, which, which I think is a reasonable number to start, which is 362.5. And we had enough money in the, you know, baked in to address everything except the 72.5. So that's really what it, what it comes down to. So we wasn't, we weren't able to do it within the target and we were short 72.5, which is not significant given the, given the breadth of, uh, of the CEO business unit budget, frankly, but uh, that's where we are. Um, I, I tried to find other monies within the business unit, but I uh, was not successful in finding the 72.5 elsewhere. Thank you. I see. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Daigle Gammon for your second time. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, Tracy, the work of your, um, you and your team is just so impressive. Um, thank you so very much. And, and I also support, I, I have a couple of questions just around, so the anti-black racism audit, is that a program audit? Would you get an external person that would come in to do that audit? And would you have sort of a, a baseline to be evaluating from to find out what is the impact? And then use that impact to present the business case, I guess for a year after year, which really wouldn't be a difficult thing because we all know it's needed. And then the African Nova Scotia Integration Office, um, I'm a little unclear on what that is. And just for a very short clarification on that role, please. Uh, when I look at that and I see $20,000, my brain goes to thinking that's a lot more than 20,000. So um, I, ne I need to measure what that expectation is, please. Thank you. To you, Mr. Chair, to the Councillor. I'll begin with speaking to ANCIO. So as I, I previously said, when we began, we didn't have a budget. So there was no budget sort of aligned to African Nova Scotian Affairs, French Services, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so the Anti-Black Racism Working Group identified that we didn't have money specifically earmarked to the work of the African Nova Scotian Affairs Integration Office. What that office does is it works closely with communities on issues of concern. So for example, as we're looking at, um, let's just take the, the Hammonds Plains Fire Station, we would do community consultations, things like that. Pre-COVID, we would do those in person. So there was an expense associated with that. We bring in speakers to do ex internal um, education pieces, 
Plus, we also mount major events like African Heritage Month and things like that. So $20,000, as we worked through, would cover the sort of operational work of that division, um, African Nova Scotian Affairs Integration Office. So that's what that $20,000 is. With respect to the audit, we have no idea what our baseline is with respect to how we as a municipality are addressing anti-Black racism. But we need to we need to to establish that baseline, and and we would have to use an external consultant to help us identify where we are and how do we measure that. Uh, I know that there's work that's happened in Ontario and Toronto specifically around anti-black racism. So engaging with some other cities, identifying somebody who could come in and help us set our baseline. <laughs> We would use that to measure our successes. And then we'd probably come back and look again in, in a three year period. So that $30,000 that we've identified as our audit is to set our baseline. In some respects, the community can probably tell us our baseline uh, and they probably know, um, but we do need some, some data, some documentation. We do so much better as a municipality when we've got data to support where we're going, and that's what this would be about. Thank you. Thank you. I just, I, I worry that 30,000 is not enough. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, I don't see any other speakers for the motion on anti-black racism. Uh, Councillor Austin, uh, I just saw the note uh, wondering if you were speaking on this, and I believe that was just for the main motion. Um, and I see a head nodding, so that's, uh, thank you for confirming that. Um, so I would like to Last. call for the question. Thank you very much, over to the clerk. Beginning with District 11, Councillor Cuddle. For the motion. 12, Councillor Stoddard. I would absolutely support this motion. 13, Councillor Lovelace. Voting yes. 14, Councillor Blackburn. Voting in favor of the motion. 15, Councillor Russell. In favor. 15, Deputy Mayor Outhead. Yes. District 1, Councillor Dale Gannon. Voting in favor of the motion. 2, Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. 3, Councillor Kent. Voting in favor of the motion. Four, Councilor Purdy. Voting in favor. Five, Councilor Austin. In favor. Six, Councilor Mancini. In favor of the motion. Seven, Councilor Mason. For the motion. Eight, Councilor Smith. For. Nine, Councilor Cleary. Councilor Cleary. Councillor Cleary, are you there? 10, Councillor Morse. In favor. Mayor Savage. In favor. And so that motion passes. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, we are back on the main motion. And the next speaker on my list is Councillor Daigle Gammon. Oh boy, I wasn't quite ready for that one, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Um, I gotta go back to my notes now. Um, on on the, the the full budget presentation, um, when it says um, well, Jacques, as I see it, Ao, when you said that the new positions are within targets, um, I guess I'm just wondering, does that make a little clarification on what on target means? Because um, I was just wondering if they were on target, then are they actually were they vacancies that got filled? Uh, just a clarification on on that around the new ones and then the other question i might have is a little bit hard to find out um in uh, some of the, the hr position stuff are there collective agreements that are outstanding that will impact um these budget numbers um or are they already incorporated is there a, a factor already incorporated into uh for any collective agreements that might uh, have a, a future impact in it. Thank you. 
to share through you with councillor. Great question. Uh, when I talk about targets, um, budget targets are as much an art as they are a science. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so Jane and her team do a pretty good job in trying to establish what budget targets look like. And uh, the way that works is that her team, uh, her analysts, go out and meet with folks in the business units. And like in my case, uh, it would be Kim Carver, uh, who's my budget coordinator, right, my executive coordinator. So they sit down together in, well in advance of setting budget targets being set, and they understand what the pressures are. And uh, we look at the total amount of revenue. So Jane, you know, basically takes all that input from the business units and comes up and tries to provide a target to the business unit that addresses most of their pressures, right? So in this case, uh, the five positions we talk about were actually, I was, I was given a budget target that will actually allow me to include the budget, the positions in within the budget target itself. So in other words, you know, finance gave me a budget target, so say go away and come back with a plan to meet that target. And this is what we came back with. Um, and the only over, the only thing that we couldn't find monies for within our target was that additional monies around the anti-black racism strategy. Mm -hmm. So um, that's, that's what we mean by target. And uh, I hope that clarifies that. The collective agreements. Um, I will defer to Sally or Kim, but I'm quite certain that all the positions we're talking about here are non-bargaining positions. Uh, they're not they're, they don't they're not impacted by collective uh, agreements to, for the most part uh, but somebody somebody may have uh, may be able to correct me on that but I think for the most part everybody that works in Gre is non bargaining uh, everything everybody that works within the NZO uh, and, and the uh, and the uh, office of diversity inclusion for the most part are all non bargaining as well that's right Jock there uh, we are all non-union positions Can I just ask a follow-up question for clarity please Absolutely. It, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. So when you say you were given the target, within that target, was that 1.9 built into that? Yes, it's all, yeah, the one point, it all feeds in. You look at the 1.9, all the business units together uh, as a whole ended up with a 1.9. So yes, the answer, the answer would be yes, it's within the 1.9. Now, it, it, to, just to follow on that train of thought, you know, should council decide to change the 1.9, we would not necessarily go into the business units to get that money. We would probably touch, probably look at uh, using uh, the 2021 surplus and perhaps some other reserve monies that would, that would be used to offset. Right? That's a conversation for Friday. <laughs> you anticipated my next question. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the question. There will be more detail on that from Jane and her team and myself on Friday. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Smith. Thank you, Chair. Uh, a couple quick questions. Um, one is focused on the social policy coordinator position. Um, would this position also be focusing on the work that would be done with procurement and contracts as well? Um, other one uh, is for Paul. You mentioned the Street Navigator program and we'll be getting more information on that. Is that related to the letter that we got from the business improvement districts asking for additional funding um, to keep that project going? And I'm also wondering from Dr. Siciliano if, if we could get a, uh, an update on some of the work that the CMTs are doing or or is that coming uh, at another another uh, budget date? Please and thank you. Okay, so Paul, those are pretty much all yours uh, along with it, Amy. Yeah, I've just been patiently waiting. Um, so <laughs> thanks for the question, Councillor, and, and uh, through the chair to you. Um, yeah, first of all, in terms of the new position, um, we're, we're not, it, it presupposes a little bit because we haven't had a chance to come up with the job description and that sort of thing, but it will be a, a a broad position that will help uh, with the implementation of the overall social policy, which includes all kinds of tentacles, which would include some of the, the work with procurement. Um, they sit on our social policy team and we, we had lots of conversations with them leading up uh, to that to that report. Um, as just for clarity on the position, as mentioned during the presentation, we, we see a, a, 
an urgent priority need with the homelessness issue right now. So um, we're going to uh, try to get somebody in who focuses mostly on that position uh, or on that issue. Uh, but having said that, that frees up some of Mary's time, Mary Chisholm, who is the senior policy analyst that works on social policy uh, to focus on some of these other issues. So um, hopefully that answers that question. Uh, answer to your second one is a simple one, yes. Um, the report that's coming is in response to the uh, the request from the business improvement districts, and we're hoping to uh, to wrap a little bit more uh, sustainability around that that program. Um, but you'll see uh, hopefully very soon, either end of February or early March. I think that report's geared to uh, to come to council. Really quickly, sorry before you go forward, does, is that going to be during budget or after budget? So how does how does that relate to our budget process today? It, uh, it will come during budget, but we do have money in our base budget um, to uh, to fund that program. OK, yeah, so it's not a it won't be an additional ask. OK, uh, and I think the next one was for you, Amy. Thank you very much um, through you to the councillor chair. Um, a CMT update, a full update on the public safety strategy will be coming to you um, as I do every year an annual update uh, at the end of this fiscal, but I'd be happy to share with you some of the work and accomplishments that we've um, we've achieved over the past year. Um, we have done knowledge exchanges with our CMT communities with Acoma Holdings, um, HRM Traffic Engineer in UNIAC, uh, Supernova with Dalhousie University, some opportunities that may be available to our youth uh, through through that program. We've done trainings despite COVID, we've managed to do some uh, in-person trainings. So we did emergency management training with Erica Fleck in North Preston, as well as in Halifax. We did a two day uh, training with Robert Wright on um, cross-cultural, working cross-culturally, which was uh, very well attended with, by all of our CMTs. And we have uh, mental health first aid training. It's been rescheduled a couple times because the CMTs want to do that training in person. So we're just waiting for, um, for the opportunity to do that, but we believe it will be done uh, before the end of this fiscal. We are creating um, story maps with residents. Uh, we had planned to do walking tours with our CMTs as a part of a global uh, project, Jane's Walks. They happen here in Halifax, but we wanted to do our own with the CMTs. Unfortunately, we couldn't because of COVID, so we've moved it all into a digital environment, and I'll be, I'm really excited to show you the work uh, that's coming out of that. Uh, basically, uh, stories from our communities, our CMT communities, that folks can uh, navigate through digitally. Um, what else? Uh, community garden in, North, uh, in uh, Uniac Square. So we have uh, 20 plots uh, all spoken for. Um, and we'll be ready to plant uh, as soon as the ground thaws. Um, and then, you know, some community connections. We've made some great connections with Mainline in terms of uh, helping to address some of the uh, needle debris. Uh, there's been, um, as you know, more of it uh, in some of our public spaces. So working with Mainline closely to ensure that that gets cleaned up by their team and uh, continuing work with the navigators. Uh, that, that Paul spoke of. Um, food security, we, we really supported, the CMTs really supported the mobile food market and the uh, distribution of food to our communities through hampers, but also seed packs um, and crisis response. So um, we just uh, supported the community this past weekend uh, with a crisis response in North Preston. Um, and uh, we have activated, although at a smaller scale, bringing in partners to support uh, incidents that have happened in Uniac and uh, Mulgrave over, over the past year. Um, yeah, so that's uh, in a nutshell what we've done this past year. I'm tremendously proud of the work that we, that we do uh, with community um, and are really excited to keep it going. Thank yeah, you. thank you and, and share this. I just want to say thank you to all the, the, the team, your team and also the CMT, the community members who are on the ground doing the work and, you know, thinking of what happened with Preston, how they mobilized very quickly 
and you know hearing what was happening in the talking circles and hearing what was happening in terms of getting out to the community and, and really helping folks with that that trauma that they dealt with or when when that incident happened you know it was amazing to see um what the cmt started as and what it is now so you know thank you to your team and and all the support from hrm to making that happen and thank you chair that's it thank you and and i echo that uh amy that is an impressive list thank you very much to everybody for the work that you're doing um mr mayor thank you chair uh thank you uh, uh thank you colleagues um every year we go through this process and i don't know if i've ever got a question on my budget and i know sean is on the line and and uh, uh, it never comes up in budget, although every now and then it does pop its head up in a mayoral election uh, without details. But um, we have in the, in the mayor's office managed our budget, I think, very effectively. Uh, we're almost 90 percent uh, HR costs, but of the non HR costs that we have in the mayor's office, I just want you to know that when I became mayor, the budget was 156,400. And uh, now it's about half that amount. Uh, we've cut dramatically back on advertising and travel and community events. Having said that, happy to answer questions. I just want to say um, through this process, and this is our first business unit discussion, uh, I believe we can get well below 1.9%. I think that we can hold the line on taxes, and I'll be pushing to see if we can hold the line at 0%. Um, and we're going to have some of that discussion starting on Friday. And, uh, but that's mainly a source of um, where the revenue comes from. And some of that is the dividend of growth in the city, such as the deed transfer tax. But, um, you know, we're not, we're only at the beginning still of the budget process. There are people who are opining about this, who are saying, well, we're going to 1.9 or higher. We haven't made that decision. I believe we can, we can stay lower. But I also think that there are things we need to invest in. And I don't think you can spend all year talking about anti-black racism or homelessness or the importance of indigenous reconciliation or recognizing the important role of people with disabilities. You can't spend the year talking about that and then turn your head at budget time. You know, you can't take a knee in June uh, and you can't attend a march in October and then when the budget comes say that's not our responsibility. So these initiatives that Jacques is talking about are important uh, initiatives. And I think that, you know, our, for people who talk about the fact that we're creeping into areas that aren't our responsibility, you know, diversity and inclusion is, an, is a value of this council, this city, and our community. Um, social development and communities are a priority area for us. And a lot of these issues that have developed have worsened as a result of COVID, but we're already existing and, and need to be dealt with. So I've said before, one of my favorite lines about budgets, one that President Biden has used for many, many years, which is, don't tell me your values, show me your budget, and I'll tell you what you value. I think that these initiatives are important initiatives. Councilor Mason's you know, put, putting forward the motion on the anti-black racism. Um, I think we can do these at the same time as we show very strong fiscal discipline, which we have done the last number of years. Tracy Jones Grant didn't work for the city when Way and I and um, you know were elected when David and Tim were there. These are new initiatives and very proud of the work that they do. And I think it builds stronger communities and ends up benefiting everybody. So I'm proud to support those kind of initiatives that are coming forward. I think it's something strong, progressive, sensible, growing communities are recognizing the need for it. And I don't see it at all contradictory to wanting to have budget discipline. I think we can do both. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you very much. Um, certainly things to keep in mind. I appreciate that. Uh, Councillor Lovelace. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and, and thank you, Mr. Mayor. Those are, those are great words. Uh, I really appreciate um, the fact that, you know, as a new councillor, I'm, I'm stepping into this uh, budget experience for the first time and, uh, you know, weighing the important approaches and, um, and, and certainly uh, considering how it is that we can uh, do the great work that needs to be done while, while at the same time ensuring that we are supporting our residents and businesses in, in a responsible uh, uh, tax approach. 
Um, so I just have a couple of comments in regards to um, issues management, uh, uh, you know, within the CAO's department, um, council support office, uh, I've raised it before where I'm uh, I'm struggling with um, perhaps some redundancy in and uh, lack of efficiencies in the way that we uh, acknowledge um, and support those issues management uh, approaches for residents and businesses. And um, in looking at how we evaluate from both a qualitative and quantitative approach um, to make sure that we're addressing, uh, you know, this uh, issue from a customer service excellence perspective. And in thinking about that, uh, I'm just uh, wondering how it is that we can um, uh, you know, create quality control uh, in an equitable manner without having issues management um, uh, mechanisms or tools. Uh, and so there's just one comment uh, about uh, for the CAO. And the other thing I just wanted to raise uh, with Mr. Johnson is around from GRIA's perspective, how is it that we can align our priorities as a municipality with the provincial um, you know, priorities, uh, considering, um, you know, as a new councillor, I, I can count um, at, at numerous times uh, where the response to an issue is, I'm sorry, we don't have that authority as a municipality. However, I can direct you to, <laughs> you know, to the uh, Department of Transportation, Department of Environment, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I just, I raise that issue, uh, Mr. Johnson, because I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how it is that as a municipal councillor, I can um, fully understand and appreciate uh, how we as a municipality are aligning with those priorities of the province. Um, and I suspect that the best place to understand that information is from uh, the GRIA department. Thank you. Thank you. Over to the CAO or Mr. Johnson. Yeah, thank you very much for the questions, uh, Councillor, through you, too, Mr. Chair. Uh, so issues management is something that we do a lot of here. <laughs> I mean, it's probably one of, the most, uh, one of the most important parts of my job. I say I work with the mayor, John, councillors, uh, pretty much every day, corporate communications. So, you know, the, the issue you, you raised, the issue you asked the question, I think, is how do we ensure there's quality control around issues management? Issues management is not a, is, is both an art and a science. So, you know, what do we, what it has to be is a team sport. Right, and councillors play a strong role in issues management because you will often hear about issues way before we do. So that feedback mechanism from councillors to the CAO and through the CAO to the rest of the organization. Um, you know, I work with uh, Sally Christie, my senior advisor, as a as a, an active role in terms of issues management. You know, just an example on the homelessness files over the last you know several weeks, there have been many hands in that in that in that conversation. And, uh, you know, uh, at the end of the day, uh, we have to work as a team to make sure that, you know, we're trying to address quality, quality, you know, the, the quality, uh, quality response to that. You know, just this week we had a, you know, I had a communication back from Councillor Daigle Gammon on an issue, you know, on, on I think it was on a Friday or, or Saturday or Sunday afternoon, we got the issue. Uh, we, were, we were able to, you know, produce some information uh, and get it, uh, you know, get it before uh, to her, and uh, you know, in a in a comprehensive way. Many of these issues are cross-cutting; they, they deal with multiple business units. Um, you know, ultimately, we have to have consultation and conversations with all of them. Timing is always an issue; will always be an issue in issues management, where public is looking for instant gratification, instant answers. It's not always possible. Uh, but uh, we do our best. Uh, we try to get you the most comprehensive support and, and response that we possibly can uh, within a time frame that's reasonable and, and, and doable, right? So uh, I, I, you know, I, I acknowledge your comment and I, and I, you know, we're trying to do a much better job in terms of issues management. Some of that issues management has, has, has to, can address, can be addressed through communications, uh, through our various channels. Right, so we've been putting a more of a focus on speaking, speaking publicly around um, issuing statements, municipal statements around uh, administrative decisions, for example. 
So that's that's one area. The other area that needs improvement is in the area of our website, as you well know, and I know, and really immunologists, both Jane and, uh, and and Jerry Blackwood, but both uh, they both had a hand in this. Jane on the on the ICT side, on the actual functionality of the website, and Jerry on the content side. Um, that is something we need to keep working on. Uh, but uh, again, we don't have a perfect yet. But if we're, you know, we're gonna we're gonna strive for for uh, something that's functional and, and reasonable and acceptable. Trying to get it to you know. 100% uh, perfect will never be achieved, but if you know if you can if you look at the 80-20 rule and say, you know, if we can get it 80% correct, that's probably going to be able to address most of the issues we have going forward on the on the on the website side of the house, right? Um, what are my comments on the on the issues management piece? Uh, on the uh, and I'll ask Paul perhaps to weigh in on on you know how do how do you work best with if I get the gist of it? How do you work best with external partners, uh, particularly the provincial government. So, you know, at the end of the day, the basic premise is the chain of command needs to be uh, understood and, and, the, and the various executive levels within our respective organizations need to be respected as well. So, you know, I work with the deputy ministers one-on-one uh, -on -one, and that communication is strong. Uh, elected officials to elected officials is generally the rule. You know, I know that the mayor has conversations with the premier and ministers, uh, and I'm sure you have conversations and will have conversations with ministers and MLAs and in, 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 in pertaining to your district issues. And that's the way to get things done, but also making sure that we're both aware of those conversations as it pertains to your district or pertains corporately. So, you know, I know that, you know, on the homeless file, I'm having meetings very soon with some, some deputy ministers on the homeless file. Um, you know, at, at some point, I'm going to need the mayor to speak to somebody at the political level on the homeless file. Uh, so it's really a matter of coordination of activity and, and, and using the using the channels that we have in an appropriate way. In Paul's work, you know, he has in, in all our all our executive directors and all our staff that work for executive directors have relationships with with their counterparts at the provincial government level. So they have direct conversations almost every day on various files, right? So it's sort of how we work intergovernmentally. Uh, you know, both at the political level and at the, at the appointed officials level uh, going forward. Paul, do you want to add something to that, please? Yeah, thanks. I'll, I'll jump in uh, for a second and through the through the chair to the councillor. I'm glad Jacques took a, a stab at that first because that is a really good question um, and um, not that uh, not that easy to answer uh, answer quickly. Um, so, uh, as Jacques said, you know, first of all, our uh, Jacques' role as CAO is is our primary intergovernmental representative to the provincial government. So we we work to support him um, on any of these uh, issues management um, pieces, like the homelessness file he was just talking about, where um, where we want to bring a position forward to the province uh, to make sure that he's you know properly. Uh, quote unquote armed with information um, and can go uh, into these meetings with with a sense of what uh, our priorities are at the staff level from all across the organization. So the, the role we play in GRIA is largely, I would say, falls to two words. One is coordination, one is monitoring. Um, so we um, it, specifically back to your question um, in terms of legislative requests, for instance, um, Council has a list of, of legislation that they've requested from the province because, you know, as, as the councillor accurately pointed out, we um, there are some things we want to move forward we can't do without quote unquote permission uh, through a legislative change. Um, your, your timing is good for the question because uh, normally we would provide an update on all of our legislative requests after a sitting of the legislature. Uh, since there was no sitting in the fall, um, we didn't have the opportunity to do that and just realized that uh, a week or so ago that we should get some of that information around, especially uh, since there are so many new councillors. So you will see hopefully in the, in the next week or so uh, a full update on all of our legislative requests. Um, and I, I, should, um, I should stress once again, these are council's legislative requests. At the staff level, we can't make a request. We have to authorize the, the mayor via letter to the province to do so. So our, our I think our biggest role in that area, like I said, is, is coordination, um, working at the staff level with our counterparts at the province to, to try to push some of these files, files forward, um, which as Jacques said, often, in, often needs to include other business units or other executive directors who are the, the subject matter experts in the area. 
Um, so <laughs> fingers crossed there will be a spring sitting very soon after we have a new premier uh, and uh, council, like I say, very soon we'll have a, a list of those those requests. Um, and then um, I guess the other piece just quickly in terms of, of uh, monitoring is uh, provincial. You, you mentioned provincial priorities, so provincial priorities and programs, specifically programs that involve funding. Um, infrastructure programs are a great example. Uh, we have a staff position, uh, David Pruz, who some of you know, who is our intergovernmental affairs advisor, who spends a good chunk of his time just monitoring what's happening in the province and making sure that uh, that we're on top of, of issues or opportunities that we either need to bring forward to Jacques or bring forward to other executive directors. Uh, and then where where required, we'll coordinate, um, you know, whether it's a response to that issue or a uh, an application for a for a program. Uh, for instance, that's that's another piece that we take on. And then um, as Jacques mentioned that my favorite phrase issues management um, that takes up the rest of our time in terms of intergovernmental uh, work. So uh, again, back to Jacques earlier comments, the the recent homelessness issue is a really good example where we've had to uh, had to pretty actively engage with the province uh, to try to wrap our heads around that. Um, hopefully that answers your question. Like I said, it's a bit of a tough one to answer. But. Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate that. Um, not knowing uh, what we have asked the province, for example, uh, you know, over the last year, um, you know, it's, it's really helpful to get a heads up on that um, just to get a sense of, you know, what legislative changes have we requested, um, but also, you know, just thinking about uh, some of these decisions that the province has made uh, to put a, a new school in an industrial zone, for example, knowing that there are pressures right now with an upcoming uh, provincial election uh, with placements of schools and where those schools could go. Certainly, uh, I'm sure a number uh, of councillors around the table have been having conversations with MLAs about, well, where could a new school go? Where should it go? And where where is the available land and so on? So, um, you know, just just having some of those regular updates uh, definitely are, are, are appreciated. And thank you so much for answering my questions. I look forward to ongoing conversations and, and issues management. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Austin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, staff. Um, it's good to start into the departmental presentations when the uh, the challenges of budgeting really become real, where um, uh, an abstract number uh, is put up against the tough choices of, well, what, what do we as council value and where do we want to spend the money? Um, I certainly uh, supportive of the items that have been added to our parking lot. Um, we'll see where that all lands later on and of the uh, initiatives that are part of the CEO's budget that are within that 1.9 percent, uh, the default budget. Um, the one thing I wanted to ask a little bit more about um, was actually, uh, I think it was Councillor Blackburn at the beginning that raised um, in diversity inclusion. Um, we don't have a, we don't have a dedicated resource for LGBTQ um, working in there, but we did. Is that is 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 that correct? Did I understand that conversation? Through you, um, Mr. Chair, to the councillor. Yes. So we had a six month term placement that was provided in partnership with Halifax Transit to allow for a 2SLGBTQ plus advisor in our office. OK, uh, so wh what was the outcome of that of that term? Is this a position that um, ideally we would like to have? Because I mean, when I look at the list of um, all the folks working in diversity and inclusion, we cover a wide uh, a wide spectrum, right? Uh, French language, uh, immig immigration, um, certainly indigenous um, and uh, African Nova Scotian. Um, it's it seems to me like that that feels like a bit of a miss when we consider the historic uh, nature of discrimination against um, and marginalization of uh, people uh, LGBTQ and that um, many still face today. It is a huge priority and we feel the, the gap in our office. Um, what was accomplished? So we developed our very first and piloted our very first uh, training that's internally developed 
unto us LGBTQ+. Uh, the position had the opportunity to look through some policy uh, through the lens of um, the community. And there's so much more that we need to do with respect to that work. And it is something that I'm continuing to think about developing what the plan would look like. As um, Jacques said, our success in our office is when we have a plan to present to council to support our ask. So we're looking more deeply at how do we develop our plan to better serve and support our 2S LGBTQ plus community and what resources are needed to do that. So that definitely is on my radar. Um, we just we miss having that position and recognize that it's something that we need to look to in the future uh, and not too distant future as we continue the work of our office. OK, um, if council were interested, um, like are you at it or is the office in a position like if we provided funds to continue a term position there? Would you would that assist in the efforts um, or do you literally still need to do some additional planning as to what this would look like? I think it goes both ways. I'd never say no to money. <laughs> uh, so so I'll, I'd never say no to the opportunity to to um, have work done on a specific portfolio in our office. And I also do believe that we do need to have a good solid plan. What was nice was that I had that term employee working on that. So it's not like I have to start from scratch. I could almost sort of pick it up and run with it. Um, so as I said, I'd never say no to money, um, but also having, you want to ensure that there's good product from, from what we ask. So every every person on my team, every strategy is providing the municipality council and our operations divisions with good product. So yes, I, I, I have an idea, I have a plan, um, but I think both things are required to be successful. Um, and, sure. and yeah, that's kind of where I'm, I'm coming from. Mr. Chair, just so I so I wait in here on this one. Uh, <clears throat> absolutely, you know, we need a, a focused effort in that area. And, uh, you know, I guess this is just sort of signaling to you, Council, uh, that we are going to come back to you with a plan around that and and, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a resource ask. Now, what we, the way I looked at this one is that, you know, there's money, there will be money in contingency for us, for those kind, that kind of an effort, right? But we need to have a plan first, and, uh, and Tracy's there. We're just not ready yet to delay that out for us. That's why I didn't actually include it. We didn't actually include that in the, in the, in the, in the budget presentation today, but uh, you can be sure we'll be back to you with uh, with a request probably mid year uh, around that time frame uh, with a request in that area that'll that'll then uh, properly staff up that position in accordance with a very focused razor sharp uh, strategy and action plan. Okay, uh, thank you for that, Jock. Uh, I'll, I'm happy to wait till then. Uh, just as a suggestion, I mean, I, I'm not going to move something right now. I don't know. I don't know what dollar amount I'd move. Um, if this is something that uh, you're thinking we will be part of the budget, maybe we could get. Um, I know in the past we've had a, we've we've kept a running list of things that council's been interested in, and then had just a short briefing note um, to consider. Um, so maybe this would be an item that we could have a, just a little note on in terms of a plan. And, um, you know, if there is an ask that needs to be made, um, whether uh, some, something something that I don't pull a number out of the air because I'm not prepared to do that today. And I don't even know if it's necessary at this stage. It sounds like you guys have put some thought into it and will be back to us um, in some form. Yeah, and that's exactly the issue we have is, that, you know, the exact the exact amount of the resource uh, and how that will work out, when it could start. and against what action plan is, is unknown to us now, and it will likely not be in place before the budget process ends, but we'll likely be at to you uh, very shortly thereafter with that, right, as we, as we, as we, as we sharpen up that plan and, and the resource requirement for it. Okay, thank you. Because at the end of the day, it's not just about the position, it's about what monies are available for programming and initiatives and partnerships and all that, so we're trying to work through that first. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I don't see any other speakers in the chat. If you, if any of the councillors 
uh, would like to uh, ask any further questions before we go to the vote, then uh, please let me know. Um, otherwise, I'm, I have just a couple of questions. One of them is in relation to the Councillor Support Office. Uh, we have talked about the newsletter, um, one of, and, and that was one of the items that was cut in June. One of the other items that was cut, and I don't think it's a, uh, in this part of the budget, was our district capital funds. And I believe that is coming up in capital. Can you please confirm that? I'll start with that. Uh, yes, <clears throat> Mr. Chair, through you, uh, district capital is part of the capital budget, and uh, that'll be uh, a discussion at that point. Uh, we, we don't foresee any major changes in the capital, in district capital. Okay. There's some, some, there's some policy work that's being done, but other, other in terms of the monitor, in terms of the quantum, we don't see any, no need to submit any significant changes there. Okay, thank you. Um, the other one is, I, I also recognize that this is, uh, one of the smallest departments that we are looking at in terms of, of staffing and, and, and budget. Uh, and in fact, we will be dealing with all four of the smallest departments today. Um, that being said, 14%, uh, 15%, uh, and if we uh, include the position for anti-Black racism, it's 15.3% for an increase, is a lot to swallow. Um, and I'm looking at the GRIA uh, ask that is listed in the in the report, and, and that is an increase of $700,000, uh, where you have three new positions for that. Um, and I'm just wondering if you could uh, provide some additional justification for what that 700000 is. Uh, sure. So let me go back. I'm just going to go back to my notes here, so I can find the proper section. I'll also ask Paul to wait in if he. Uh... So, the um... I'm just going to go back to my notes here on, on your specific specific to Gria, right? So specifically Gria, and I'm looking at uh, page eight of the report. Uh, and comparing that to slide six, where it looks like you've got the uh, public safety program coordinator, the GRIA social policy coordinator, the regulatory moderniz modernization analyst, but the increase uh, in funding is 713,000. I can uh, I can jump in here, Jacques, if you want. Yeah, go ahead, sure. I'm just trying to find my own document here. Um, so. Yeah, through through to the uh, through to the chair, the um, the total of just over seven hundred thousand um, dollars falls into. So there's three primary areas within GRIA where that would fall. So the first is public safety, um, which would include the uh, the one of the positions you mentioned, um, the seventy thousand reduction in the Department of Justice grant that that Jock mentioned falls in there. Uh, and the there's approximately a hundred thousand dollars for the uh, policing study that is that was requested by by a council, uh, which will also lead part of that study would also lead to the uh, the public safety strategy renewal or the new revised public safety strategy. Um, so the second area would be the Halifax partnership. Um, so again, as Jacques mentioned, there is a, a net sixty five thousand dollar increase uh, for development of the economic strategy. Um, and as part of the service agreement with the partnership, uh, the money we provide to them each year is subject to a 2% annual increase. So 38,000 roughly would be the figure for that increase this year. Um, and then again, as you mentioned in, in the, the main GRIA budget, it would be the two additional positions, the, the homelessness position, social policy coordination, and the new regulatory modernization analyst. Um, and then over and above that, it's it's basically uh, the vacancy management removal and the restoration of of some of the COVID cuts from the last budget. Um, so that's the that is the total of the uh, roughly seven hundred thousand. The only thing I would add, Mr. Chair, is uh, that there was a transfer of the regulatory modernization position uh, from C Corporate and Customer Services, so about one hundred fourteen thousand dollars of that. So. You know, as you see, that's a that's an increased cost, not my budget, but a decreased cost over there in corporate and customer services. There's an offsetting effect there. Sorry, you're, you're muted, Mr. Chair. 
Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Just, just, just as a side, it takes me a great pleasure to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it does. It doesn't happen very often. Um, and, and I'm sure mo more people would love to see me muted. Um, I, I believe I was looking at the numbers after that transfer of the departments into uh, into the CAO as per uh, the email discussion last night. Um, so, OK, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for all of that. I also don't see any further uh, uh, people who would like to speak in the chat. So with that, I would like to call for the question and hand question. it over to the uh, hand it over to the clerk. Beginning with District District 12, Councillor Stoddard. Some background noise. Okay, thank you. I vote in favor of the motion. District 13, Councillor Lovelace. Voting yes. 14, Councillor Blackburn. Voting in favor of the motion. 15, Chair Russell. In favor? 16, Deputy Mayor Outhead. Yes. District 1, Councillor Dago Gammon. Voting in favor of the motion. 2, Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. 3, Councillor Kent. In favor. 4, Councillor Purdy. In favor of the motion. 5, Councillor Austin. In favor. 6, Councillor Mancini. Uh, voting in favor of the motion. 7, Councillor Mason. For the motion. 8, Councillor Smith. Four. District 9, Councillor Cleary. Councillor Cleary. 10, Councillor Morse. Voting in favor. 11, Councillor Cuddle. Voting in favor. Mayor Savage. In favor. Uh, Councillor Cleary, was that a vote for yes? Yes. Thank you, sorry, appreciate that. That is everyone, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you very much. And and so that motion passes at this point, it is right at 12 o'clock. Uh, I apologize for um, losing focus there for a second. Uh, we had conversations in the chat about it being lunch. And what I would like to do uh, with, uh, if, uh, council doesn't mind is is break for lunch and then return at quarter to one one o'clock and continue with the human resources budget what is everybody's preference about a time to return one o'clock one o'clock fair enough so we will break we will break until 1 p.m and uh we will see you all then all right do we come back to this uh this one no, nope. to, con to confirm for everyone, you will go to the one o'clock meeting invitation you have in your calendar. So do not return to this one. Go to the one o'clock meeting invitation. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, members. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the presentations. Thank you. Have a great lunch. <laughs>